Good morning. Good morning, everybody. We're about to begin the next session. If you could take your seats, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Barry Dever. I'm the managing partner of McCann Fitzgerald. Uh, we're delighted to sponsor with Deloitte the uh, conference today, and once again, delighted also to be a partner with IIEA, who we have uh, worked with for many, many years. Um, I hope you're enjoying what has been a fascinating session so far, and the level of insight we've received has been a testimony to the quality of the speaker that has been attracted here today. And the title of the next session is The EU Without the United Kingdom, and when I was thinking about it during the week, um, I was reminded of the immortal line of Captain Boyle in uh, Sean O'Casey's Juno and the Peacock when he said, the whole world is in a terrible state of chassis. Uh, that was first uttered on the stage of the Abbey in 1924, and I wonder what Mr. O'Casey would make if he were alive today to say the same thing. So to get on with the um, introduction, as we heard earlier, uh, safeguarding the great progress that the Good Friday Agreement has brought to this island has been the major concern of the Irish government, and indeed of the other European member states in the Brexit discussions, and rightly so. But once that key issue is resolved and the ultimate form of the trading and economic relationship between the EU, UK and the EU becomes clear, the focus in Ireland in particular will undoubtedly focus uh, on what being a member of the EU without Britain uh, being a member will be like. And it's been clear to us from early on that because of geographic, historical and cultural ties, Ireland is in a unique position when it comes to Brexit with experts united in their view that it will have a significant impact uh, on the Irish economy in almost any scenario we can forecast. And while some of the more extreme commentators have called for Ireland to join our UK brethren in leaving the EU, even the more sober among us would recognise that our membership of the EU will look fundamentally different with the loss of what has historically been our closest ally in Europe. We joined the EU, as we know, on the same day as the United Kingdom in 1972, and on most occasions since then, we have seen eye to eye with each other in Europe, particularly around regulation, where we've been generally very closely aligned. And post-Brexit, we all know that Ireland's going to have to develop new alliances right across the EU and deepen the relations that we already have with our member states so that we retain the same degree of influence on the issues that really matter to us. We in McCann Fitzgerald have always been keenly aware of the importance of the EU to Ireland, and we were the first Irish firm to set up a Brussels office in 1974. And I'm delighted to see that Gerald Fitzgerald, a uh, partner in, in McCann Fitzgerald at the time, is here today. And he actually opened our office way back in a prescient move in 1974. Um, similarly, in a move that proved unfortunately prescient, we set up our Brexit steering group in the autumn of 2015. As it became apparent to us that while this outcome might be unlikely, if it were to happen, the effects would be quite extreme. And in April of that year, we partnered with IIEA ahead of the vote to uh, look at what might happen if Britain were to vote to leave the European Union. So as the negotiations have progressed, we have helped clients plan for many different eventualities, though as yet things haven't become as clear as we might have liked. So we're therefore delighted to partner once again with the Institute of International and European Affairs for this prestigious event. Such a high calibre assembled and the quality of that uh, panel, both earlier this morning and to my left here today, is a testament to the reputation of the Institute, not just in Ireland, but right across the EU. And we in McCann Fitzgerald believe that a major law firm must show leadership. And as we, as we gain experience through working with our clients, uh, getting unique insights and opportunities to influence the outcome of various business and financial matters, we see it as essential that a law firm like ours plays a leadership role in facilitating the ongoing discussion around the impacts of Brexit, the commercial, legal and regulatory issues that will arise, and in particular on the future relationship of Ireland, the EU and our relationship with the UK. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Philip Andrews, who's now going to moderate an intriguing discussion on the issue of the EU without the United Kingdom. And the expert panel to my left today of Jose Manuel Barroso, Catherine Day and Dominic Grieve will undoubtedly give us very valuable insights into that issue. Just a little bit about Philip. Philip leads our competition regulated markets, EU and trade law group, and he focuses on antitrust, transactional and counselling issues. 
He has represented a wide variety of clients before the European Commission and also before the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission here in Ireland and various national regulatory agencies. Philip practiced law for six years in Brussels and is co-author of the leading textbook in Ireland called Modern Irish Competition Law and Practice. He's also a fantastic colleague to us and one of the very best practitioners in EU and trade law in this country. Um, the next topic, as you know, is the, is the um, EU without the, U the UK, uh, a pretty weighty topic and uh, it poses major questions for us here in Ireland, not least the question posed by Conor Brady, who's a member of the Institute, in his excellent article in yesterday's Sunday Times, when he posed the question, do we in Ireland follow Macron to the heart of Europe? A reference to Macron's speech in Strasbourg last Tuesday. So thank you for listening and uh, like me, I do hope you look forward to an intriguing discussion with our panel. I'm going to hand you over now to Philip Andrews. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Barry. <coughs> Excuse me. I will try to follow Olivia, Olivia's um, skill um, in the earlier panel. Um, and let's get kicked off. So um, I'm going to start with Jose Manuel. Um, you were the European Commission president for 10 years, from 2014 to 2004. Um, you, at that time, would have engaged in the Lisbon negotiation treaties. Uh, you would have been confronted with the financial crisis. Uh, your, your, your wisdom uh, and, and, and ideas and thoughts on the politics at, level, at, the, at the EU level that may be playing out now. And I would maybe perhaps hark back once to Bertie Ahern's moment uh, in the earlier session when he said, might Ireland be, be brought into the Halloween party at the very end uh, and left with a, with a do or die situation? <laughs> Look, um, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. It's great to be back in Dublin, where I spent so many hours discussing uh, in different formats the European Union issues. Um, asking me to give my perspectives on the consequence of Brexit, namely from a European perspective, my first point is that it was, of course, very bad news for Europe, because uh, Britain is one of the most important economies in Europe and indeed in the world, permanent member of Security Council, a credible power in defense terms, uh, incre incredibly networked uh, country all over the world, home of the English language that became now the lingua franca uh, in the world. So for many other reasons, uh, we are losing one of the most important members of our club. And when that happens, of course, the club is poorer. Um, so it was a, a problem. At the same time, I think today the mood in Europe is let's, let's move on. Frankly, the kind of debate we had here this morning that I heard uh, together with you, I think it will not be possible in most European countries today because that's not a priority. It is a priority in Britain and here. But it's not certainly a priority for the German Chancellor that has been trying to form a government for the French president that is in fact trying to launch his reforms and they has, uh, his own priorities. In Italy, they are trying to form a government. Or, or the other countries, I could quote all of them. Typically, the European Union takes decisions very late. Uh, it, only when it has to take them. And so today, this is not yet a priority, but there will come a crunch time. And the crunch time, I don't know where it will come, but of course there is some kind of commitment to respect the timetables. It can also happen in European Union that, as we usually say, we stop the clock. When there is no an agreement, we try to get some more time. Typically also there is some moment of drama, and I think uh, it's almost unavoidable that we'll have a moment or more than one moment of drama before an agreement will be made in case, of course, an agreement will be made. I continue to think that uh, the most likely scenario will be to have an agreement, but not a very ambitious one. The European Union certainly wants an agreement. I have no doubts about it. The European Union, by definition, by, uh, I would say, genetics, by its culture, is for a compromise. 
and the, the, not only European institutions, certainly the Commission, but the um, European countries, they really want a compromise. But we have to understand one thing. If in Europe it is difficult to come to a common position, it's even more difficult to change a common position once it's taken. <clears throat> and that's what now the British government is discovering. The British government was uh, expecting that after some negotiations there will be a kind of real movement in the uh, European position, and that's not happening. And let me tell you my, my <clears throat> testimony when I had it sometimes to intervene in important negotiations uh, in trade, for instance, with some of the major players globally, it was clear that it was much easier from a European perspective to convince the others to change than for the Commission to convince 27 or 28 countries to change. This is the reality. And this is extremely interesting because at the same time, this is the strength of the European Union. Once it takes a position, it's so hard to change it or it can change incrementally or in the margins. But basically, until now, the European countries have shown, in fact, a remarkable unity in terms of their position, namely the mantra of uh, no sherry picking. And in fact, they understand that if they start now opening this or that um, exception, that can be difficult for the future. So from my point of view, a compromise looks still possible. I hope it will be at least to keep the status quo in terms of goods. I think it will be absurd to have now the introduction of quotas or um, tariffs uh, between Europe and the UK. It will be more difficult, of course, in terms of the single market, because while many people in Britain believe that uh, trading services is like other trade, that's not European understanding in European Union terms and doctrine. It is very much linked with droit d'établissement, with other uh, conditions, with regulatory conditions that in fact uh, make it very difficult if a country is not in the single market and even less if the country is not in the customs union to have access to the uh, single market. So I think Britain will not achieve its goal of having uh, full access or almost full access to the single market. I think there will be at the end some kind of accommodation of some concerns, some pragmatic <clears throat> arrangements are possible, but it's going to be extremely difficult, so, namely in some areas that are very important from a British point of view. Um, one of the more complicated factors was and is certainly the Northern Irish issue. People already spoke about it, I'm not going to repeat. But, and the, the, but the fact that the, the British government has defined a position of not being the customs union, of course, makes it much more difficult. So I'm sure that now a lot of thought is being given, not only in, a, in Britain, but also in Europe. How can we find a customs union that is not the customs union, but a customs union? The creativity of law, lawyers is boundless, so there are. And I can tell you the creativity of the European Union, the Commission and the Council, uh, lawyers is indeed great, so if there is a will, there will be a way, but that is, in fact, one of the most difficult issues I think we have to face in these uh, negotiations. But I'm sure the European Union countries want a solution that will be respecting the fundamental aspirations of Ireland. I have no doubts about it. And uh, <clears throat> I also am sure that Britain wants a solution for it. The, the, the government of the United Kingdom wants a solution. So it should be possible, provided there is some um, flexibility. And uh, I hope that will, of course, not put in, in, in danger the overall agreement. Now, what can be the future of the European Union uh, without uh, Britain? First of all, it depends. It depends on what we say or what we do as uh, the young uh, uh, participants, in the, participants in the previous uh, uh, discussion have shown, there are a lot of ideas about the future. I personally believe, and uh, I'm speaking now after this experience of 10 years leading the Commission, including of the most difficult times after the no vote to the Constitutional Treaty, we had to find the Lisbon Treaty, the terrible financial and sovereign debt crisis, and other crises like the uh, gas crisis with Russia, the, the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia and so on. Yes. One thing I can tell you, I believe the resilience of the European Union and the resilience of the euro 
are much higher than most people assume, namely in the Anglo-American world. We have shown that resilience. I, was, I had the honor to represent the European Union in the G8, in the G20, in bilateral talks with the American president, Chinese leadership of Japan. And at that time, I remember, most people were assuming that Grexit was unavoidable, Greece will leave the euro, and maybe the euro will collapse. That did not happen. And of course it was, and that is important to understand, the European Union is not a state, and at least in the foreseeable future, will not be a state. It will not be. So it's incremental. It's by nature fragmented, time-consuming, terribly frustrating sometimes in terms of time, of political capital investment. But at the end, there is a compromise. At the end, it works. This is important to understand the European Union. So there are two scenarios I think that will not happen. The disintegration of the European Union, some would like it, but it will not happen. Or the United States of Europe tomorrow, that will not happen. We are going to have something in between, if you want an image, a scaffolding. It's a process where ambiguity, to use an expression that was already used today, ambiguity can be functional. Diversity in the world like the one we have today, diversity can be a way to deal efficiently with a world with increased unpredictability and increased variety. When the environment is very unstable, for a system, it's sometimes better to increase the level of its, increase the level of its complexity to cope with these changes. And that's where I believe there will be room in the future for the European Union, and indeed, if you want my opinion, also for the role of Ireland. Ireland is, in fact, a country that has been punching above its weight in the European Union. I can testify, not only because I'm here with uh, my good friend Catherine Day, one of the highest officials that work, was working also when the time I was in the Commission. But you have a great diplomacy and we have very competent experts in all fields. And I've seen some situations where Ireland, being not one of the biggest states, uh, was able, in fact, if it defends with determination its interest, can in fact achieve its goals. And I see a role for Ireland in the future not only in the linkage between the European Union and Britain, but also, why not to say it, in the linkage between uh, the European Union and Anglo-American world. Because I believe more than ever, we need that commitment. As the world is going now, for instance, the engagement with the United States of America, even if I know it's difficult in some areas, we need it. And Ireland can play a role. One of the suggestions I could leave for the future, I know it's not to be tomorrow, but why not to think about it in the future? Why not an FTA between the European Union, the UK, and the United States of America? Okay. That will make sense. How That's the rational thing to know and to do. Because, and in fact, in the relations with Britain, there is one thing I keep saying to my European friends. <clears throat> there will be no country more important for the European Union as a third country than the United Kingdom. Now people are very sad, some frustrated, some irritated, but we have to think strategically. The United Kingdom will remain a very important country for the European Union. At the same time, the United Kingdom will have to understand that if they decided to leave a club, and they, without, because they did not want to pay all the fees of being the club, named the freedom of movement of people, of course they cannot have exactly the same rights. So some kind of solution has to be found in that spirit of compromise, and okay. I believe it can be done. Can I bring, Thank you. Can I bring Catherine Day in on that? So Catherine, you've been um, <coughs> Secretary General for the European Commission for uh, 10, years, 10 years, two term, um, and at, in that position you had the privilege to sit on European Council meetings. Um, you wanted to talk a little bit about, about the trade issues that might arise um, and the loss of expertise, I think, mm -hmm. with the departure of the UK and what that might impact on the regulatory uh, analysis um, we have. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we're going to miss the UK. And we heard this morning already a very strong uh, illustration of how Ireland is going to miss the UK in the EU. But I think the wider EU is also going to miss the UK and I want to focus on three areas. The first is trade, because the most ardent advocate of free trade, international free trade, uh, inside the EU has been the UK. And it is, uh, in the age of globalization, a model that has brought prosperity uh, to the small countries like Ireland that are small open trading economies, to the wider EU, and also lifted billions of people out of poverty across the globe. 
And I do have a concern that without the UK being there to urge the European Union to stay open to the outside world, that the siren voices of protectionism uh, will be slightly stronger around the EU table. So I think we're, we're going to miss them on the trade side. And it's never been more important for Europe uh, to be the, 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 the voice of rallying the rest of the world to stick to what has been a good model since the Second World War. Um, what we are seeing now uh, among the biggest countries like the United States, like China, is a desire to go back to getting what they want because they have the clout, they think, to get that. And mm -hmm. I think we will all lose if we, uh, if we don't stick to the multilateral order of agreed rules, however frustrating uh, it, it is in terms of negotiation. But so I think the European Union has maybe of necessity been a bit too inward looking in the last 20 years. It now needs to really become again the advocate of the international trading order. And it is good news um, to see that the EU-Japan negotiations have been concluded. EU and Japan together account for one third of the world's GDP, so very important uh, economic weight. Uh, the good news over the weekend of conclusion on Mexico. We need more messages like that because I think most of the world um, understands uh, that even if there is give and take, uh, a rules-based way of organizing world trade is by far the best. So that's one area where I think we're going to miss the, the UK. The second is in the area of what I call reform um, on two levels. Every time we have had treaty changes, um, the UK has been among those who have been arguing um, against the uh, seemingly inexorable transfer of powers to Brussels. Um, and I think that in future work in terms of deciding where the EU is going, we do have to have a continuing debate about uh, sharing power and it can't only be a one-way street. Um, there are issues where member states cannot solve their problems on their own, migration being the latest sad illustration of that. But there are other areas where I think we have to be open to some transfer of powers back to the member states in order to find that flexible accommodation between working together in our interests when it suits us, but also um, respecting um, different national ways and different national practices uh, for things that maybe um, we can trust, trust the member states to manage for themselves. But also reform with a smaller um, uh, definition, and that's in the whole area of regulation. Um, President Barroso knows very well um, how uh, unyielding the British have been in terms of pushing uh, the better regulation agenda, wanting less Europe, less interference. It does go back, as was said on the panel this morning, I think, to the difference between the common law country and the civil law basis of, of the European Union. Um, again, I fear without the UK at the table, there will be a degree of regulatory creep in the future European Union, because quite a lot of other countries actually want more decisions taken in Brussels. Countries that are maybe have strong regional differences or weak governance, um, they prefer to have European rule making. So I think that, that um, argument over what should be done by Brussels, what should be done nationally, um, is not going to go away anytime soon. And I think from an Irish perspective, where we prefer the light touch regulation, we will have to work harder to find allies to keep that debate going. Um, my third area then is just a very, since I'm the, the non-politician on this panel, is a technical one, and it's about the loss of expertise. Because I think in, in um, where, the, where the real work of the European Union is done once the big political directions have been set is in thousands and thousands of meetings of experts. And the UK has brought a very valuable, again, international reach um, in certain areas like financial services, although the UK never was going to join the Euro, um, they have been perhaps the biggest single shaper of the European Union's financial services arrangements to date. Uh, also because they wanted to shape it to preserve and protect the position of London while not being in the Euro. Um, the Medicines Agency, the UK, is one of the biggest um, initiators and leaders of clinical trials. So these are just two examples of where we're going to, I think, miss uh, the UK for the future. But having said that, it's not all bad news. I think there are also some areas where we will miss them less. Um, the UK is constantly cast in the role of putting the foot on the brake uh, of European integration. And I think in some areas where that foot is lifted, um, it will be positive. I'm thinking particularly of the whole uh, social area. 
where the UK has definitely um, uh, been a freezing element in uh, maybe not, not totally strong efforts by the rest of Europe to develop a social agenda. But I think um, it's clear that you cannot leave swathes of the population out of the benefits of EU membership. There has to be a way to have a modern social agenda uh, to fight against the forces of populism and extremism. And I think there, um, there is now a better chance, minus the UK, to develop that social agenda. Um, and the last area where I think we will miss them less will be in the constant sniping and undermining of what the EU is trying to do. Um, British journalists have very effectively used ridicule uh, to undermine the earnest and, and sometimes slow efforts of the EU to build what is a unique construction. And I think we will have much less of that in the future. And it has infected um, the media right across uh, the European Union and beyond. So I think there, there are big areas where we'll miss them. There are big areas where maybe Europe can, can move ahead. And in the areas where we will miss them, I think one of the answers was already given this morning, we have to stay very close to them. And I do think that the UK will, outside the European Union, will realize how much it has in common with the EU in lots of areas and will seek to work with the European Union as a friend of the European Union, as uh, an important economic power um, that will more likely than not throw its weight in behind the EU. I've been in lots of climate change negotiations where it, it has often been a lonely journey of we would be up on the platform saying the EU plus Norway and Switzerland. I can see in lots of cases in the future in different negotiations we will be up on the platform saying the EU and the UK argue for this and that. So I think um, there will be a time, a time shock when the UK actually goes. All the things I've mentioned I think we will have to take care of. But I think over time we will mature into um, a relationship that's based on self-interest and that's the biggest motivation of all. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Dominic Grieve, um, you've been a MP for 21 years. Um, most notably in your career you've been the Attorney General um, from 20. 10 to 2014, um, including Advocate General for, the, for, for Northern Ireland. <coughs> um, and you've maintained a strong interest in uh, the rule of law, as we've seen your uh, challenge in the Parliament, that the Parliament should have a vote on the matter. Um, we're not going to have a, a British Europe. Will we have a European Britain? It's very difficult to predict what the uh, future of the EU is going to be without the United Kingdom. Uh, what is clear is that the United Kingdom's uh, decision to leave um, has as its base not, I think, an internal difference within the Conservative Party. I think that's a mistake. It's one manifestation of it, but a much wider resentment against the sense of external bureaucratic control over the United Kingdom. I mean, it does seem to be a rather interesting oddity of these islands that we periodically throw up revolutionary movements which are led by bourgeois, um, and we've done it here on this island, and we've done it also in the United Kingdom based on tradition, which completely overturns the existing order. And then people have to pick up the pieces afterwards. Um, and we are in the United Kingdom in the process of picking up those pieces. Uh, and it's not at all clear how the pieces will be picked up and what the United Kingdom's input or where we will be in 12 months or two years' time. I was asked, I think, to speak this morning a little bit about where the United Kingdom is going in this debate. And obviously where it's going is going to shape what influence such as we may have in the way in which the EU tends to develop thereafter. My view is that I happen to agree with what the last two speakers have said. I mean, I think the EU's got plenty of problems, uh, and some of those problems are of a quite systemic character, and I think they need to be addressed, or there is a risk that the EU may fray at the edges again. But that having been said, I also happen to agree that the EU is a very resilient organisation, and I don't think it's about to collapse tomorrow, as perhaps some of my Conservative uh, colleagues at Westminster might secretly wish. The problem at the moment is an internal one about the United Kingdom and its destiny. And perhaps I could just touch on that a little bit. Uh, we have precipitated a political crisis for ourselves. 
We have precipitated a political crisis which destroyed a government within 20 seconds of the EU referendum result. We precipitated a crisis which then led Theresa May when she tried to get public support for the government to carry through Brexit successfully. She wasn't able to get it in the general election last year because the climate of uncertainty that had built up was so great. But at the same time, we have a situation where, on the face of it, public opinion is as polarized, if not more polarized, than it was at the time we voted in 2016. Indeed, Professor Curtis, who's done the polling, says, well, you know, you look across the polling results, and frankly, the only real shift is that some of the people who voted Brexit are dead, and some of the people who are coming onto the electoral register tend to have a different point of view. But that might mean that uh, the UK's change of position would take 10 to 20 years. And in my view, once we're out of the EU, I don't think there's any real likelihood of our going back in because we couldn't get the terms of UK exceptionalism, which have been the thing which have been so important to us in our membership. So we are heading sometime in the autumn for a major political crisis in the United Kingdom. And that crisis will determine, I suppose, one of three possibilities. One is whether we leave on the terms that are negotiated, uh, and some of those terms may be very uncertain. Secondly, that the deal gets rejected with the potential that we might leave on the 29th of March next year, or the 30th of March, with no deal at all. Or and the final possibility, which I don't think can be entirely excluded, is that the crisis which is engendered leads to an outcome where, in fact, the British people have to be consulted again and could even potentially change their mind. That's how I see things shaping. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to be a disturbing influence on the way the EU progresses, although I accept that the disturbance is going to be much harder here than probably anywhere else in Europe, where, on the whole, people just want to ignore it. Mm. But the relationship we're going to have with the EU whatever form it takes, is clearly going to be of considerable importance, I think, actually, to the way the EU progresses afterwards. But unless we are wholly out of it in the WTO relationship, the UK's impact because of its economic size and its destiny in terms of whether it thrives economically or does badly is clearly going to be seen as a mirror held up across the EU to how the EU itself is performing. So I, I hesitate to answer your question on the EU's future. I happen to think it's a resilient organization, and I regret that we're leaving it. Um, I regret that so many of my uh, uh, fellow countrymen seem to have misunderstood what the EU is about, which is one of the reasons why they're now having so much difficulty coming to terms with the UK's departure. They've always seen the EU as a foreign sovereign state from which we are negotiating secession not as an international treaty organization governed by a rule book, which is why we're having difficulty negotiating with it, because you can't really go outside the rule book, whereas there seems to be a British idea that you can. Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I can't answer that second question about the EU's future. It will continue, but what interests me, obviously, as a British politician, is what is our relationship with the EU going to be? How's it going to progress in the next six months? How's it going to end? in terms of the continuing political crisis in the UK, and assuming we're gone on terms, how will that then have an influence on the way our economy grows and the well-being of British people develops, and how will that in turn have a mirror into the EU's future? And that, I think, is the big imponderable, and I'd be very hesitant, as I say, to try to answer that question. Thank you. Well, can I, perhaps to give it um, some perspective, um, can I ask each of you what you would think are the three top um, issues facing Europe right now? And uh, if you wouldn't mind saying where Brexit lies in those, if it does, <coughs> and maybe hesitating some possible solutions yeah. to those issues. I can start if you... I think the issue more difficult for Europe now to deal with is this issue of my illegal migration. That is putting a big pressure in some of our countries, not all of them. In some, this matter is frankly not an issue. But in some countries, 
uh, the attitude towards illegal migrants uh, is indeed fueling um, anti-European uh, parties, mm. and uh, it's putting out of pressure in the, let's say, mainstream political forces, and it's in fact also dividing the European Union, because some countries simply do not agree with a common approach on that. And so, I believe that uh, <clears throat> if the European Union wants to keep freedom of movement inside, and that is a goal, by the way, a treaty established goal, the condition to keep the freedom of movement is to be credible in terms inside, is to be credible in terms of our border outside. Sure. So that's why I think there will be some progress in that area. By the way, that's also something that can also happen because of Britain leaving. I think there will be some progress in terms of the European identity, in terms of defense. Uh, Britain is, of course, a very important partner, also as a NATO member and a nuclear power, but it's not uh, by accident that now we already had this progress with the permanent structured cooperation on defense. From that point of view, besides Brexit, there are two other unificators of Europe. It's Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin. <laughs> when President Trump is asking the Europeans to spend more money in terms of defense, namely on NATO, the Europeans can spend it on NATO, but also on developing their own capabilities uh, by the way, in accordance with NATO doctrine of pooling and sharing. So I think there will be some progress there, and also because some of our member states are in fact terrified with the possibilities of some actions or provocations coming from Russia. And so, <clears throat> European, everything that is now linked with illegal migration, internal security, security of the borders, fight against terrorism, and a stronger defense is at the same time a vulnerability of Europe and an opportunity for some progress. It will be, I repeat, incremental progress. We are not going to have the European army as some people were uh, fearing, uh, but we are going to see some progress in that area. The two other issues, I think it's, of course, I mean, in fact, these are already two or three, because it's defense, it's uh, security, I mean, internal security, and also terrorism. I think these are the most important challenges, something that could come outside. Of course, trade globally, uh, I continue to think that at the end, uh, Mr. Trump is a very transactional leader, so until now, in fact, trade between Europe and the United States have, has not been affected. <coughs> On the contrary, it has been growing, and in fact, the deficit uh, of the US has been increasing. Uh, but of course, there is a problem for Europe, uh, because Europe is relying, as it was already said, in an open, uh, let's say, global system of trade and multilateral trade. So that is also a challenge for Europe. Brexit comes in all these issues. So <coughs> as I said before, this is not in the mind of most Europeans now as a priority. I just came from Naples yesterday. I can tell you there the two issues is if the football team of Naples is still able to win the league in Italy and about the new government in Italy on this order. These are the priorities. Brexit is not certainly the top three priorities, you see, in most of our countries. Mm. That's the point. But there will be a time when this will come and, uh, and there will be a crunch time. There will be, and this is a very important moment because, as I said, there will be no country more important for the European Union and Britain. I mean, comparable probably the United States of America, but Britain because of its, of its geography is so close to the rest of Europe, because of the linguistic, cultural, economic, investment, trade, financial, all these relationships, in fact, it's a critical. Today, for instance, people don't know that, most of people, the third partner of Europe in terms of trade, it's Switzerland. Small Switzerland comes immediately after the United States and China as our most important partner. So, of course, Britain will be a much more important dimension than Switzerland. So it's mm. critically important that we do these uh, negotiations at the end with some reasonable compromise. If not, it can be having uh, negative effects, not only for Britain, I'm sure about that, but also for the, the, the European Union. Catherine, can I ask you your, your, your views on that? Um, well, I would agree. I would put migration as the top priority as well. Um, I think we will find a solution. It might take five more, five plus years, but I think we will get there. I think we need a much stronger external border, and to that extent, I think maybe Brexit will will uh, be 
will not be unhelpful. Um, I think we also need managed migration. European populations are aging. Uh, if we want to keep up our standards of living, we're going to have to have more migration. I think it's a debate that the politicians have to have with their publics, so I won't go further on that. The second point, I think, is Eurozone integration. It's very technical, uh, but the Euro is not yet as fully stable, as well established as it needs to be. I think there's widespread recognition of that across the Eurozone and beyond. Um, there, and I think there is agreement on that, say, between France and Germany, but not on the detail. But I think there is agreement that we have to go further um, in, in um, making the euro as proof from future crisis as it needs to be. And in this country, I don't need to elaborate further on why. Um, can I ask on that, Catherine? My, sorry? Can I just ask on that? Um, what role Ireland has in, in, that, in that negotiation? Is it an Anglo-French determination? <clears throat> um, no, I, I, I think it will not move until France and Germany agree. Mm. Uh, I think uh, there's plenty of room for all other countries to have an influence on that debate because I don't think they agree on other than that, the basic need. Um, I think sure. that okay. um, there's a lot of experience to be brought to that debate in the design mm. of it. Um, and I think very little of it will be public because it's so technical. I think if a lot of it will go on through the experts and then mm. uh, the politicians taking the decisions, but that will have been prepared by, again, uh, the necessary experts. But my third point um, is more difficult to be precise on, but I would say the third item for me on the agenda is a mix of values and engagement. And one reason why I think the migration crisis is so dramatic is because it does touch on does Europe really have shared values? Um, and I think there's, it looks as though uh, in part of the newer member states, in, particularly in Poland and Hungary, at least in, in the leadership, there seems to be a different interpretation of those values. Mm. Now, um, and I think the European <laughs> Union has to address it. I think uh, the Commission was right to go down the road of, of taking more formal proceedings to underline the importance of our shared common values. And it's interesting that an Irish judge has decided to refer a case mm. to the European yeah. Court of Justice. It will be very interesting to see. I'm sure the court was uncomfortable to get that referral, but it will be interesting to see what they say. Mm. But I do think the thing that's been the most difficult, and Brian Cowan said it this morning, is how do you bring the, Europe, the EU debate and make it internal? How do we stop seeing it as something that, you know, Brussels made us do this or Brussels wouldn't allow us to do it? How do we bring it home and say, well, we are Brussels, we are at the table, we are participating in all of this? How does, how does the European Union regain um, public buy-in? And I think what's happened over Brexit has been an eye-opener right across Europe to um, what we thought we could take for granted in terms of rights can suddenly mm. be taken away if you decide to leave. Now, that, that will not be a lasting effect, but I think we have to really you know, redouble our efforts to get the buy-in from the population, to woo them away from the populists and the extremists, because that, that kind of rhetoric, I think, mm. is the most damaging. And it's the area where maybe at governmental level the EU has been the least uh, mm. successful. Dominic, can I turn to, view, turn to you <coughs> excuse me, on a, on a specific issue, and it's looking forward, and it refers to a question that the IFA president uh, made earlier. What, what, what is this, um, you know, this new Jerusalem you're, you're building in, 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 great, in, in great Britain, global Britain? Is it going to be a, um, a taker of the environmental and um, animal standards, or is it going to... Uh, um, are you going to see chlorinated chickens and uh, hormone-injected beef? I, I, I think not. I think this goes back a moment to some of the things we've been talking about. The, the difficulty with the Brexit debate, and it was quite clear during the referendum, is that what often happens when you build an issue around quite an, a, 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 an important matter. You get people coming in from all sides who will unite, who otherwise have entirely disparate and contradictory agendas. Mm. So Brexit was driven by a combination of deep anxiety about the future of the country because of the financial crisis of 2008, the perception that the EU had been rather poor in responding to it and had been relatively unsuccessful in global terms, huge anxiety about migration, a 
course, became centred on freedom of movement, but actually on the doorstep during the referendum, that wasn't the question that was being raised. It was the vision of thousands of desperate people trying to cross the Aegean or cross the Mediterranean to get into Europe with absolutely no policy in place at a European level to address this. And you only had to see some of the stuff that was put out. I mean, the, you know, the one of the posts are about 76 million Turks are about to come here because they're about to join the European Union and you can do nothing about it. Promoted by one of my colleagues who's still in ministerial office, even though at the time it was pointed out uh, that she had just said something which was manifestly inaccurate when she said that um, the UK would have no ability to prevent that from happening. So you have that and you have it linked to a it's wrong to say xenophobic, but certainly a deep anxiety about the erosion of national identity and national values and national cohesion in the face of globalization of which the EU is a manifestation which is irksome because it is controlling. But those people have not the slightest desire to have free market economics at all. Indeed, as Labour has found, because remember, the Labour Party has been split by this, as we have. It's just expressed itself differently. On the contrary, the message is one of maintaining standards, even over to the point of protectionism. Now, that's then linked to a small libertarian group. I get them in my uh, constituency, and they are manifested within the Conservative Cabinet who believe that the United Kingdom should turn itself into the Singapore of the North Atlantic. Uh, they think that the EU has been over-regulating. They think that it's possible to do trade deals with other countries and have free trade because freed of the individual interests of the 27 other member states, it will be much easier to get them. Uh, they would like a low tax, a probably low welfare society, and one where, although they want regulatory frameworks, they think we can be much more flexible mm. once we're free of the dead hand of EU bureaucracy. I, mean, I have to say that if I, you know, politicians shouldn't make predictions, and then we make another prediction a week later, as Bertie Ahern said, we change our minds, but, or a contradictory prediction. But I just don't think this group has any significant traction in the United Kingdom whatsoever. I mean, I keep on saying to them, your vision is going nowhere. The more likely outcome is that if Brexit doesn't work, you'll end up with a protectionist left-wing Labour government, led by a Corbyn-like figure, if not Corbyn himself, who simply sees departure from the EU as the opportunity to destroy a capitalist construct. That's the risk to us. Mm. And if I were putting my money I would say that I don't think that this vision of the chlorinated chicken uh, future for the UK has any traction at all. And so, just to widen it a moment, there was Bertie Ahern talking about regulatory alignment. And there is an irony about this. I mean, I think if the EU is prepared to give us regulatory alignment with the opportunity to diverge on notice when we wanted to, I'm prepared to take a small wager that in 10 years' time we won't have diverged on anything. Because what we'll have got is our, excuse me, our shinofenery. We will have got our ourselves alone. We are able to do what we want without interference. And hey, presto, you'll then find that having got that, we'll continue to behave in exactly the same way as we did before. <laughs> well, can I, <clears throat> can I uh, uh, ask just one more specific question on that? <clears throat> Last week's negotiations ended on Wednesday without an, uh, an, uh, an outcome. Um, there was, I saw at least one um, insider saying that the um, British proposals on Northern Ireland were subject to um, forensic annihilation. Um, what, what, uh, and, and there seemed to be quite a bit of um, discussion immediately afterwards back, back in Britain about that and the imp implications. Is there any flavour you can give to us on, on how that might come out? The Prime Minister clearly, as she said on three occasions in three major speeches, wants to try to do a deal which gives us a deep and special relationship with the EU, which preserves almost every single framework of participation in the single market and the customs union without being in either. That's what she wants. And I'm absolutely clear in my mind, that's genuine. Now, the difficulty is... 
Catherine, the, may... the difficulty is, what happens if we can't get it? And, I mean, it's a difficulty for me. I mean, we've got a debate coming up on Thursday on a customs union. But I mean, let's be clear about this. Participating in a customs union whilst being outside the EU is not an ideal state of affairs. The vassalage allegations of, um, of Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, my colleagues, have some force about that. It's a relationship of dependency, and the Turks haven't quite liked their customs union very much, and I'm not sure that we would. But on the other hand, if you're asking me the question, do I think a customs union is better for the GDP of the UK than these mythical third country agreements, which Liam Fox is gallivanting around the planet trying to secure, I think you will find there is a very large number of parliamentarians at Westminster who think that Liam, whilst very commendably going all his travels, is wasting his time. And, and this is the classic dilemma. So, I mean, I don't know what the, so, the solution is. You're, you're, if, can I, if can the, can yeah, I you ask? Bring Catherine, I'm talking can, too much. We'll see Catherine. what she has to say. <laughs> I think Dominic has uh, said very well what the UK wants. The question is, if they can't get it, what mm. then? And I think what the Commission has been doing very well is to say, OK, UK, we've listened to all your red lines. We've looked at uh, our red lines, because we're not going to undermine the inter integrity of our single market. Uh, here's what you can have. And that's what's written down mm. in the withdrawal treaty. Uh, and yep. that's what um, has been um, scoping out of the future relationship. And while the clock is ticking very fast, we're still not in the end game. I think that uh, it, in, in circumstances which are very frustrating for the EU negotiating side, um, at least if one side is clear and says, here's what you can have if we take at face value everything you say, that's the only way to move it forward because now the onus is on the UK to come back and say, well, maybe a bit of this, not that. But until the UK is able to put up an equivalently detailed yeah. negotiating position, I think it's extremely difficult for the EU to move further. And I think President Rosso is right to say that once the EU has decided, it's very difficult to change. And that's why when asked what's the future relationship going to be, and if you take, if you're respectful of the red lines the UK has mapped out, then it can only be around the Canada model or around the Norway model. Mm. Why? Not because the EU is, is not negotiating. It's because each of those models were built on, on multiple compromises inside the EU. Mm. And you can't now remove just one bit of those compromises without some EU member state being very agreed. Can I ask one question on that? Um, to Jose Manuel. Um, Jose Manuel, excuse me. You, we, we hear some um, about uh, certain member states, perhaps, or certain parts of the EU, wanting to make um, an example of the EU, wanting to make the the exit in such a way that it will discourage other other member states from exiting. I mean, is that? Do you think that's a a, a factor, or is that a, a media? Story. I mean, I don't know if that goes in the mind of some people, but frankly, I don't think this is the case. I think it's uh, the idea of punishing the United Kingdom will be ridiculous because, in fact, the European Union will be punishing itself. Uh, I think the fact is that the European Union has rules. The common market or the single market, as rules, by the way, it was to a large extent a British invention, the single market. It was then uh, to a large extent uh, responding to initiatives of Margaret Thatcher and with Lord Cokefield in the Commission. So that is the irony of things. If there, there is a country that has been given contributions to the single market, it has been precisely the United Kingdom now. And there are some rules there. Uh, and so certainly, I think British leaders will understand this. You cannot be <clears throat> in a club only to get the benefits and not to pay some price for it. Freedom of movement is, in fact, a basic principle of the uh, single market. Since the beginning, it was freedom of movement of people. And so, and by the way, the champion of freedom of movement has been, to a large extent, Britain. Britain was one of the countries that did not use the clause, transitional clause, when new member states joined the European Union. You remember, it was under uh, Tony Blair government. 
And Britain has been, by the way, the champion of the enlargement of the European Union. So Britain cannot say, oh, we, we don't want this freedom of movement now because now these countries are very poor and there is a big difference. Because that, is, that was the argument. By the way, because it was precisely Britain. If it was not for Britain, I think, we will not have probably had the enlargement so wide as we've got at the end. So this is why today, to keep the integrity of the, of the internal market, this is a very serious issue for the European Union. It's not mm. just to play a hardball with, with, this, uh, with the, the British. And by the way, from that point of view, I think uh, it will be wise to, to have realistic expectations uh, on that matter. Uh, I said it, by the way, privately. At that time, I was still president of the Commission. When David Cameron uh, put that condition, I said to David Cameron, please, David, ask anything except that. Because you are not going to get it. Mm. So while there was a concern in some of our member states, including in Germany, because the, the position was, oh, maybe Angela Merkel will support us. Because in Germany also there are some concerns about too many, let's say, non-German uh, coming to the, uh, the market there. But Germany could not, for instance, let down the polls. Mm. It's very important to understand the relationship between the Germany and Poland. So it's when there are so many polls that it becomes a problem. When it was others, there was not a problem. And so that's very important to understand. The European Union allows for some differentiation, but not for stratification. If yes. we have yes. the idea that now there are first class and second class countries, then it will be a problem. That's why, of course, if now uh, the, Brit the European Union will give to British government everything the British government is asking, it will be, of course, an incentive mm -hmm for the Europhobes or the hard Euros kept in some of our countries, we want the same. We want to be out of the European Union, without, but with all the benefits of being in the European Union. Okay. I, I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I'm sure people want to ask questions, but can I just ask one very quick question of each of you, uh, very quickly to um, speculate, uh, guess, as to where the EU-UK relationship will be in 10 years' time. It depends. <laughs> That's the answer. It depends. He's a lawyer. It, no, it's not. Nothing is settled in advance. In advance. It depends. But okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I think the events of the last two years have shown the perils of prediction. But um, what I would hope would be that uh, we will have a mature, grown-up relationship between the UK and the EU. I, I suspect. Uh, there will be a lot of uh, regret in the UK because they will lose influence. I think uh, it will have an effect on their standard of living and well-being and their influence in the world. But I hope that uh, we will have found the way, even after treaties have been concluded and all the rest, mm -hmm. to come back into uh, a good way of working together, despite the fact that we once okay. were members of the same union but no longer are. Well, I suppose if I had it my way, we will still be in it. <laughs> but that, that's dependent on a number of factors and realistically um, uh, probably won't happen. Uh, but I wouldn't totally exclude it. Wow. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> I also, let me just, since we are in the discussion, I also don't exclude it, but I consider it, it's unfortunately from my perspective, because I'm, I'm a pre-European, very committed, I remain loyal to the European Union. At the same time, I'm sometimes accused of being Anglophile. So I would not, but... In honesty, I think the probability of avoiding the Brexit is uh, relatively yeah, low, I agree. very relatively low. Uh, and I think it's important because for business and for, for all of us that have to take decisions every day, I think we should make the central assumption that Brexit is going to happen and we have to be ready for it. Now, if it does not happen, great, but most likely, the most likely central scenario will be that Brexit will happen. And so I think the responsibility of grown-up people, as uh, Catherine was saying, is to try to mitigate negative effects as much as possible and to build a minimum basis for a fruitful relation for the future. Um, do you have questions from the, from the floor? Ah. It's quite hard to see with the light. Can we have a microphone up uh, out in the front seat? Could you introduce yourself? 
Uh, good morning. Uh, Nora Owen is my name and I'm a member of the Institute uh, and I have found this a fascinating day. I think I want to ask Dominic a specific question because he has spoken to us at the Institute. But I think one of the t things I'll take away is President Barossa's reminder to us that there are not panels like this sitting throughout Europe discussing only Brexit and trying to help us to make decisions both in the UK and Ireland. We just have to remember that. We're very exercised about it here, but it's not happening necessarily all over. And Brian Cowan referenced to the difficulties in some of the other European countries who couldn't care less really what's happening over here because they have their own problems. But I wanted to ask Dominic, um, during those early days of confusion when uh, Pr Prime Minister May was trying to sweeten the pill as it were, she immediately said, we will no longer be part of the European Court of Justice. You'll be free to commit all the crime you want and we'll deal with it. It'll be our business and you won't have to go to that awful court. But as time went on and as her police forces and her security forces began to tell her how important Europol, the court was, um, she's kind of moved back a bit. As a former Attorney General, can you help us to understand whether at the end of the day um, Britain will still, as it were, allow their citizens to avail of the European Court. I mean, there'll be British citizens living all over Europe and they will need the right if something goes wrong when they're living in France or Germany to maybe use the court. So have you any more wisdom to add to that particular side of the debate? Thank you. First, it's right to say that I don't think the Prime Minister didn't understand the importance of the European Court of Justice because as Home Secretary, she'd been absolutely resolute in wanting to integrate the UK into the 35 uh, Home Affairs and Justice um, uh, agreements that many in our, our party, Conservative Party, didn't want to do, uh, precisely because it subordinated us to the um, jurisdiction of the ECJ. But the ECJ has a pariah status in the United Kingdom, uh, which is part of this narrative largely created by the press over a, quite a long period, and where I think actually we as the political class have only ourselves to blame. I think it was Catherine who made the point in her opening remarks about how the U UK's perceptions of the EU have been distorted over time uh, by a whole series of, of ideas of what the EU is and how it works. And so for a government to keep us in a relationship where the ECJ has a role beyond transition, I have to say to you, I think is very unlikely because the risk to the Prime Minister, if that were to be suggested, is that it would raise um, uh, rebellion on conservative benches, which would be sufficient to, depending on how Labour behave, to destroy her majority. She'd need to depend on another political party to shore her up other than the DUP. So um, I have to say, I mean, that's why the government has constantly pushed there will have to be separate arbitral mechanisms for resolving disputes. I mean, the bizarre aspect is that the United Kingdom you know, is the greatest treaty-making power in world history. I think I'm right in saying we've signed up since 1834 to over 13,500 treaty agreements, of which about 800 have arbitral mechanisms for resolving disputes. And the amazing thing is that my lovely country is extraordinarily good at observing the judgments and implements them without demur, even when they think that they're a bit wacky. You know, sometimes get tribunal decisions. And by the standards of international tribunals, I mean, I don't wish to give a peen of praise to the European Court of Justice. It has its quirks. But by the standards of international tribunals, it's pretty good. And yet, bizarrely, we will cheerfully sign up to other international tribunals that might be created ad hoc to resolve our future relations with the EU, but it can't be the ECJ. That's the reality. And I think she'd have great difficulty selling the ECJ. Um, I mean, I've been suggesting to her politely that we might moderate our position on that, but that's precisely why I'm telling you that I think it's likely to be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, there is, a, is that Tom Arnold there, I think? Yep. Well, I'm not Tom Arnold. I'm Willie McCarter, and uh, <clears throat> I was CEO of Fruit of the Loom from the late 80s to 90s when we had 3,000 people working between Donegal and Derry, 100 truck movements uh, a day over a very hard border. Uh, I've lived there all my life and I was with the International Fund for Ireland from 1989 to 2005. So I have some experience of 
border areas. Uh, I would like to offer a possible solution, uh, which is entirely above my pay grade, but I'd like to throw it out to the panel. And that is this, that Brexit seems to me, and indeed Mr. Barroso has adverted to it, it's, it's a bit like a, a long-time member of a golf club deciding one day that they're going to exit the club. And they say to the other members, I'm going to exit the club, I, I don't want to pay any more dues, and I'm out the door. But going out the door, they say, by the way, I, I feel I'm entitled to come back and use the facilities of the club, play the course, I use the clubhouse and all the other facilities, but I'm not going to pay any dues for this. And furthermore, you know those rules that I, that I adhered to when I was a member? I don't feel like, like adhering to those rules either. Well, if we were members of that club, we'd feel pretty aggrieved uh, at that attitude, uh, not the least of which was, if we agreed to it, why wouldn't any other members take the same attitude? And where I think there might be a solution here is most of the of British industry, business and the financial sector in the UK uh, are firmly in the Remain camp. They would like, like Mr. Grieve, uh, to remain in the EU. So I think there might be a case for, for that whole sector saying, look, we will raise 10 billion sterling per year uh, which we will give to the UK government on a permanent basis so that they can donate our dues of 10 billion a year to the EU. And if we do that, and that could be done by, I think, a half percent of every commercial transaction <coughs> in the UK. If they did that, my question is, would the, would the EU, having got the promise of 10 billion sterling a year, which would conveniently plug the whole in the, in the EU budget. Would the EU entertain such things as an agreement whereby uh, the EU would negotiate what I would call a special single market and a special customs union for the UK? And because it's a special customs union and single market, there might be some special conditions. There might be Going to uh, Catherine Day's point, uh, there might be a, a special uh, immigration agreement negotiated over time. There might be uh, a joint EU uh, European Court of Justice, uh, sorry, a, a joint UK European Court of Justice court to adjudicate uh, disputes. And there might be a condition which says to Britain or UK, you find any, trade, any free trade agreements you want across, across the world. Please feel free to do that. But just with the proviso, that, and bearing in mind they talk about regulatory <coughs> uh, alignment and so on, with the proviso that if you do find free trade agreements, they cannot work until you bring the 27 members of the EU with you. I just wonder, you can know, I, if I? you pay the Jews, I'm finishing, uh, if you pay the Jews, is there any possibility that the EU might come to the table with some kind of agreements like that that would effectively allow the status quo to continue? Because I think in a dysfunctional world here in Ireland, in Britain and the, U and the UK that, uh, and the EU, that's very important. It's more an EU-directed question, I think, than a UK-directed question. I mean, the only thing I'll say about the border is you've got to understand that within the United Kingdom, the attitude is, and it's wrong, I want to emphasize this, is that the border is, should not be a problem because we have no intention of putting up any border checks on the northern side of the border. Mm. That, 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 that's the, so, and there's a lack of understanding, total lack of understanding, actually, about the social aspects of the border. So it's seen largely in terms of goods. So well, as we're a free trade country and as we have no intention of mm. providing a barrier to trade, well, if it, if it, we're not going to have customs posts. There's a lack of understanding about some of the problems about will you be able to go to your GP who happens to be on the other side of the border? Will you be able to go to a school which happens to be on the other side of the border? Uh, and about the regulatory divergence and the consequences 
uh, on things like food, uh, agricultural standards, and all these things that, that, that it's just sort of blotted out. Um, but as for, I mean, if I may say so, the, the, the vision you were putting forward is one that would likely to have very considerable appeal to a UK government. And I mean, we are paying 50 billion, approximately, for some privilege or other in leaving, which otherwise we would argue we shouldn't be paying at all. So there is a sense that there is a cost to going, although the EU would take a slightly different view about what that, the reasons behind making that payment. Um, there is a desire for a continuing relationship, but the problem, as I was saying earlier, is that it's a continuing relationship on terms that the UK itself crafts and not the terms that the EU wants to give us. I, I think it's un unfortunately, in a way, not about, only about the money. I think the money was demonised yeah. as part of the yeah. campaign. Uh, but if it was as simple as the UK just agreeing to continue to pay, it would, would be done long yeah. ago. Um, it's about much more important principles. I mean, why is freedom of movement so important? Apart from the fact that it makes the single market work, it's about not discriminating between EU citizens. Mm. And once you would open that breach, I think you wouldn't know where, where to close it. Um, the reality is the UK is going to have to pay for whatever deal it gets. It's to stay in the Horizon 2020, the research programme, it wants to pay, it's willing to pay. To have access to the single market, it will have mm. to pay. Will it add up to being more than their overall budgetary contribution? Who knows? But if it was only about money, it would be easy. Unfortunately, it's about even more important things than money. I think I have one or two more questions here. If we could make them relatively short and concise. Yes. Uh, Ronan Tynan, a uh, very brief question. I must say, I thought uh, we would get an optimistic, some optimistic scenarios today, but I'm actually more depressed than I was coming in, because it seems if, I want to put this to Dominic Reeve, if uh, Mrs May wants the benefits of the single market and the benefits of the customs union and still be outside, and the Irish government, quite rightly, is not going to tolerate a, a bor any kind of border, uh, replacing the non-existent border at the moment with 99.9% .9 support of the population, Surely the prospect of no agreement is real. Yes, yes the prospect so, of no I... agreement is real, in my view. I, I mean, I think it's actually a very real risk, and I, I think that there's Mine a, is to that. There may be a lack of understanding sometimes about, about just how great a risk it is. Sorry, go ahead. No. Sorry, Paul Copland, Shannon Aaron. Does Dominic not agree that regulatory alignment in whatever guise, whatever name, will win out at the end of the day? because Britain wouldn't countenance an, an unorderly, a disorderly withdrawal. They'll want a, an, an orderly withdrawal agreement and the implementation come transition deal. Is that not what is going to happen to God at the end of the day? Okay. What, more, more questions? Or do you want to... Um, yeah, I, 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 there was another question over here. We could take, we take a group two, and then we can be more than me. Just to answer. Thanks. That's one. Tom Ferris, member of the Institute, very brief, and it's to Dominic. You made the point, and we dis one had to listen with the tone, the United Kingdom has no intention of putting up borders, but the internal consistency is, if the United Kingdom is outside the customs union, there will be borders. Yeah, got that. Um, another, a third question here, maybe. Thank you. Bobby McDonough, Department of Foreign Affairs. I, I just want to tell a very, very brief story which concerns two of the panellists and which I think Excellent. illustrates perfectly why, why the European Union has provided the context for the peace process in Northern Ireland. Mm. Uh, just after the executive was set up and Martin McGuinness went into government with, uh, with, with Ian Paisley, uh, Ian Paisley contacted the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin, an interesting channel to use, and he said that he wanted President Barroso to visit Belfast as soon as possible. So I was the permanent representative in Brussels and I phoned Catherine Day, who was the Secretary General, and I conveyed this message. And President Barroso, who was in Washington at the time, very kindly agreed to take a detour on the way back to Brussels through Belfast. And you may remember the first photographs of Martin McGuinness um, and Ian Paisley laughing together. What you may not all remember is that President Barroso was in those photographs. <laughs> and so the, the political wisdom of Ian Paisley was, was to see that in order to have a relaxed photograph 
of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, it was necessary to give it a European context. Uh, just while I have the microphone, I want to say to the third panellist, to Dominic Grieve, thank you very much for being here. In the first uh, session this morning, there were several references to the fact that with Britain leaving the European Union, the contacts between Irish and British politicians and civil servants uh, will, will inevitably decline. But you have always taken a particular interest in Ireland and your voice is very welcome today and will continue, continue to be very important into the future. Okay, <laughs> to answer those? <laughs> so that, um, yeah. well, sure, sure, well, some of the um, Regulatory alignment, I mean, my point is simply this. I think that in reality, it is unlikely that the UK will in practice depart very much from regulatory alignment if, if it is granted to it, because I think the balance of self-interest and the, self, the groups who will want to maintain alignment will be so persistent that in reality, I begin to think there's nothing where we're going to want to change. This is one of the ironies. Of course I understand that the border, if, if there is a hard border, there has to be border controls, although arguably the UK could simply say, well, that's your problem. We're not doing it on our side of the border. But I realise that that is, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, not a, it's not a credible position. But I would also say this, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily the best judge, but kind enough to say I take an interest in, in Irish matters, both north and south of the border. The border exists today. I mean, it is actually enforced in certain sectors. It, it is more than just a line, but fortunately, it doesn't really affect locals very much at all. Um, but I do have an anxiety, the Northern Ireland context has been highlighted, that if, if there's a perception that the border is being overused, and I can understand why the Irish government sees it as absolutely key issue in the entire negotiations because of Ireland's wider interests, if it's overused, then it does, I think, risk precipitating a backlash in what I call moderate unionist opinion north of the border. And I picked that up on the last time I had an opportunity for talking to them in March. Now, it's gone away again, I think, a little, but that does trouble me in, in the overall context of the future. Um, and, and the other thing I'm just going to say is that, you know, ideas put forward that the, the boundary can be down the Irish Sea and that the Northern Ireland can some way be carved out um, are absolute deal breaker. It won't happen. Just as I sometimes worry that, in fact, the ultimate reason why we won't reach any agreement with the EU on anything is because of Gibraltar, which I have to say to you, I think, is a very real possibility. Uh, because if the Spanish government does seek to use Gibraltar in any way on sovereignty over the airport area, for example, I can promise you there won't be a single person at Westminster who vote for it. I can't testify on this because one of my, one of my moments of um, satisfaction was when Prime Minister Cameron asked me to mediate yeah. the Gibraltar issue discreetly between yeah. himself and Mariano Rajoy yeah. from Spain. Yeah. And uh, at that time, um, both countries were in the European Union. And so, in fact, we found the situation mm. because, in fact, there was problems in the border, as you know. Mm. So it was not a free flow between Gibraltar and, and Spain. It was very harmful. And, uh, OK, we found this quickly. It was not even in the press, but a solution uh, was, I think, found. Now, thank you, Bessa, for your remarks regarding uh, the European Union uh, and the European Commission action on Northern Ireland. I think that, in fact, is important to, to acknowledge. And I have great memories of that meeting with uh, McInnes and Ian Paisley. In fact, I kept that photograph from very long in my office. And Warren Singer, we have here, there are two or three politicians laughing, and they were very sincere. It was a real moment of, of, of um, congratulation. And I think the European Union, through the peace uh, program, uh, it was not just political support, financial support, the task force that we have created. The European Union, is, it's fair to say, was always helping a solution of this Irish issue. And that should be recognized. Coming back to the customs union, that will be my last point on this. I mean, the difficulty with the customs union is that uh, you cannot be inside and outside at the same time. You cannot be half pregnant. It's very difficult. Now, I have a great confidence in the lawyers of the European Union and also of Britain. And I'm, I'm sure they are trying to find 
a conceptual arrangement for that. But that can be, in fact, uh, extremely difficult. My experience also in the European Union is that sometimes when we cannot find a solution for a problem, the best way to find a solution for the problem is to enlarge it. That's why the European Union negotiates so often in terms of packages. So I will not exclude, <clears throat> and that's why the remarks made today by Bertie are, are heard on that matter were quite interesting. I do not exclude that, of course, um, then can be a, a wider problem to solve, not just about the, the Irish border. <clears throat> so I think we have time for one more question, maybe, maybe two. Um, down here. Uh, Frank Wall, member of the Institute. It said of Brexit that we must um, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Uh, given that the worst would be a hard Brexit, and we should prepare for that, um, it's, it's obvious that Ireland will suffer more than any other member state as a consequence of, of Brexit. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of the disruption to transport uh, of goods from, from Ireland to, to mainland Europe. I'm thinking of uh, Irish agricultural exports to the UK uh, being affected by a cheap food policy being introduced there. Would the Commission be prepared to show solidarity with Ireland's dilemmas by putting forward a special package to help Ireland address these kind of problems? We'd know better than that. <laughs> Neither of us speak for the Commission any longer. No, no. <laughs> Um, that's a classic solution to a problem. I certainly wouldn't exclude it, but I, I think the, the scale of the problems we're talking about with a the, with the hard Brexit would go beyond. Again, it's not only about money. If money was the answer, it would be much easier to solve, I'm afraid. So. I'm not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> we have a fir maybe a final question then from... The very corner. Thank you, Chairman. Justin McCarthy, Irish Farmers Journal. I, I think we've heard a lot of uncertainty here today, and, and that uncertainty has to be taken against the backdrop of, of Ireland's deep, deep economic relationship with the UK. I suppose from an agri-food point of view, as, as was pointed out by the IFA president earlier, there's none more exposed. The UK has to import 100 million euros worth of food every day. 12 million of that comes from Ireland. I think given what we've heard today from possible no Brexit right back to WTO scenario and the uncertainty that there is in the UK. I'd be interested if the panel feel that Ireland should be looking to the European Union and asking them what is the safety net if all this goes wrong and they, they do crash out because there's going to be a lot of sectors very, very heavily exposed to a potential uh, bad situation which nobody knows may, and may, may become the end result. So is it time that Ireland would ask Europe what is the alternative, what is the safety net? I'm also, not, uh, I'm also not qualified. I think the takeaway for me from this debate is that it, it would have been much simpler if there was no Brexit. <laughs> uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure the Prime Minister says that every morning when she gets <laughs> Apparently she voted against it. Huh? She did vote against it. Yes, I'm sure she did. Yeah. Uh, I, have no, I have no doubt at all the Prime Minister didn't uh, wish this upon uh, the country. Uh, she sees it as her duty to try to carry it out in accordance with the wishes expressed in the referendum. And that in itself is a difficult enough conundrum to, as was said earlier, to ascertain what it is that people are really asking for. Um, I think we... Do we have one final question? This on. Um, I'm Lisa Whitten from Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, I just had a question on citizenship. Equality of citizenship was referenced earlier as one of the principles underlying the Good Friday Agreement. With the Brexit and carrying out of um, all of the implications of that, there could be a reintroduction of tiered citizenship in Northern Ireland if Irish citizenship holders in, in Northern Ireland have access to EU citizenship rights that British citizen holders don't. So I wondered if um, you could make any comment on whether there would be an appetite in the UK government and from an EU perspective to 
introduce some kind of special provisions to enable equality of citizenship to be uh, safeguarded in Northern Ireland for British citizen holders? Thank you. I, I find it, it, it's a very pertinent question, but it's a very difficult question to answer. If the United Kingdom is, as a constitutional entity, leaving the European Union, then the status, obviously, there will be a, a, an unusual feature, which is that any person resident in Northern Ireland has the opportunity to claim Irish citizenship if they wish, and as a consequence of that, to enjoy EU citizens' rights. But they will effectively be the EU citizens' rights of a person living in a country outside of the European Union. And I don't really see any way around that, because otherwise we're moving to something really rather extraordinary and highly complicated. And either we're carving Northern Ireland out of the United Kingdom, which for political reasons, as you'll be aware, is not going to happen, um, or um, I think it would create a very strange muddle, and I don't really see how the rights could be conferred. I mean, it will, it will undoubtedly give privileges to people uh, because uh, an EU national, uh, an Irish citizen living in Northern Ireland who chooses to apply for an Irish passport can then, you know, benefit from Schengen when they're traveling around within the EU. I mean, I, I, we don't know at the moment to what extent the benefits may be different. And there may well be things which they can tap into, like uh, you know, educational opportunities, which are only available to EU nationals, irrespective of the fact that they happen to be living outside of the EU itself, because they have an EU passport, a passport of an EU state. And I think that's logically where we're going to end up. Yeah. From a European Union law perspective, exactly as Dominic Grieve just said, so if uh, you are a European citizen, you have all the rights and duties of European citizen, and you cannot be discriminated against hmm. in the European okay. Union, suddenly, or when you are uh, under some circumstances. For instance, there is also issues of consular protection. But, uh, but, uh, but to, 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 to conceive two kind of, let's say, orders inside uh, Northern Ireland, for me now speaking as a lawyer by training, right. seems to me quite difficult, if, if, if not impossible. But in fact, the principle of non-discrimination of the European Union citizens is in fact fundamental in the European Union treaties, by the way, and, and I think that, that, cannot, uh, that there, there should be no exception, certainly to the, Europe, the European citizens, Irish citizens that are living uh, in, in Northern Ireland in the, uh, while they are, of course, in the European Union. I think we've come to the uh, end of a very interesting session. Um, I want to thank in particular uh, Dominic for making the journey over here. Pleasure. Pleasure. For Jose Manuel for making an even longer <laughs> journey over here from Naples. You're both very welcome to Dublin. And uh, Catherine, thank you very much as well. I think we've had a superb chat and very informative too. So uh, I might ask you to pay the usual respect. Ladies and gentlemen, can I say to you that I don't know about yourselves, but I've had a, a fascinating morning. Uh, we've heard things and been exposed to things that some of us might have thought a little bit about, but nothing uh, to the extent that we have been both entertained by our previous speakers and my four co previous colleagues, um, and just now, as well as our young people from across the island. Um, I would like on your behalf, first and foremost, to thank uh, my colleague Barry Andrews and all his team in the Institute of International and European Affairs for the hard work and uh, sweat that's gone into this. I'd like also to thank uh, our co-sponsors, um, two law firms, a uh, law firm and a fantasy firm, uh, and you, the ordinary members, as well. Uh, this has been a very significant event, and I think um, we are indebted to those people who have actually organised it. Thank you. 
in my view, Brexit paradoxically has begun, but it hasn't yet started. It's not unlike the phenomenon that surrounded in 1939 the invasion of a far off country, Poland, and the phony war that followed it for such a long time. And I think central to this particular discussion today has been our relationship with the English, we as Irish people, not with Britain as such, but with the English. And I think we have to be very noted of the fact, the fact that while we are conscious, those of us who studied history, that it was Soviet blood and American dollars that enabled democracy to reappear in this continent, but they would not have come had there not been the incredible courage and tenacity of the English people who held out the prospect of democracy on that island for two very long years. And they are right to be so informed of their place in history. And they are right to have that respected and recognised. And I think sometimes we, the Irish, equally proud of the journey that we have travelled, don't fully understand the depth of feeling that they are entitled to have. And therefore, in the journey that we're now going to have with our English neighbours and relatives, along with the Scots and the Welsh, but there's far more of the English uh, than the other two, it's an, une it's an uneven uh, federal system, if you like. First and foremost, there have been very, some very useful ideas that have been discussed here. Former Thishuk Bharti Ahern in particular, talking about reinventing the structured relationships that we had for a period during the Good Friday Agreement negotiations. But also now that England is leaving, and I don't think there is any way back from that particular decision, now that they are leaving, I think we have to recognise that we have a responsibility. Because the rest of the European Union member states aren't particularly vexed about this particular matter, as we've already heard. So the responsibility falls to us in our many different ways to begin to forge a new kind of respect and relationship for a member state which may be leaving the European Union but is certainly not leaving Europe and is certainly going to be the same physical distance away from us across the Irish Sea that it is today. That's a challenge. That's not easy necessarily for us uh, to, to embrace but it is in our material interests for us to so do. And in that respect, I think we're going to have to learn to love the English in a way that perhaps uh, we didn't show um, in the past because of the difficult times that we had with them over a long period of history. And many of you have heard me articulate that before or listened to similar comments, but I think they have been vindicated by what we've heard today. It's up to us in Ireland, all the arraignment of diplomats and business people and intellectuals, and trade unionists and the whole gamut, uh, to begin to, to look at what does it mean to have a relationship with a people who we have been neighbours to since at least 1169, depending on what date you want to pick arbitrarily and fix as the starting point. But it does go back that far. Um, and I think the Institute, with your help, can try to do that. The other thing we have to recognise is that while we as Irish, along with the other small countries uh, of the, that make up the European Union, have the comfort zone of being able to say we're Irish and we're European, the bigger countries, Germany, France and England, don't necessarily feel the need to say that they are European. They don't have to. They saved Europe. It's self-evident, and they're proud. They're proud of what they have achieved. Some of those comments that I've made might fit uncomfortably with some of you, but they're far less uncomfortable than a battered and weakened relationship that we will be, of necessity, forced to construct across the Irish Sea if we don't begin to learn how to do it. I want to thank all the organisers, all the sponsors, and everybody else for helping us to start this conversation. Brexit's going to be with us, in my humble opinion, for at least another five to six structural years before we get beyond that particular point. And we're on our own. 
Yes, the Commission will do what it can. Yes, it will, if it's possible, uh, do the sort of things that we want. But if we don't know what we're asking for, if we don't know why we want it, and if we don't present a very coherent case to ensure that we get it, we've only ourselves to blame. Thank you very much indeed.